to ask questions. And I saw Alisa nodding there. Maybe Alisa, while they're lining up for questions, you want to <laughs> add, a, add no, your I, thoughts about you know, the trauma of doing these stories and how you take care of yourself and why you do this. Alisa, you were nearly killed yeah. it, two no, years ago. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I think I think I really think that for me, and I think I'm sure this is true for for all of us, and for Yanis as well. The the way I make myself feel better is by writing. I mean, if I couldn't write about it, then I'd really be in terrible shape. But if I could write about it, then then it's I don't know. It somehow makes it makes you feel better. Um, it's a good one. And it's yeah. I, that's what matters to me. I, yeah, also there, there is medication, it helps also. <laughs> <laughs> there are some good pills out there. And, uh, okay, you're not right. authorized to be prescribing. <laughs> <laughs> Question, please. Yes, um, so when you're working on a story that you believe in. Can you, can you say who you are? Oh, I'm, I'm Scott Golden, and I'm a citizen of the world. <laughs> uh, but when you're working on a story that you believe in, and, it's, and, you, and you believe it's an important story, and as y'all have said, it's a very, this is hard work. You have to piece together the puzzle. Can you speak to the temptation when you're working on a story and you believe that you know the story, but there's a missing part? Can you speak to the temptation to fill in that part because you know the truth of the whole story, but you don't have the particular part that you need to, to make this, the story to the journalistic level that we know we need. Does anyone want to take that? What if you don't have like a smoking gun or? I don't think there's a temptation to, I think that you want to keep going. If you have that missing piece and you know that's what it takes, it might be frustrating, but you just got to and there might be competitive and competition out there, but I don't know, I can say for the fish story in particular. You become obsessed with the missing we piece. We became very, we thought for a long time that maybe the only people buying this fish was Piggly Wiggly. <laughs> 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 and it had to be I bigger love Piggly than, Wiggly. or not that, that, that that's the only one we could prove, that we could <laughs> prove without any shadow of a doubt, but we knew a lot of other companies were buying it. so. I don't know, if you think, if you have something that is really amazing that needs to be told, you hold off as long as you possibly can to, to, to complete the task. And you become a bit crazy during this process and drive everybody else around you crazy as well. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Sarah? Sarah is from Syria. I am. <laughs> Hi, my name is... Sarah from Syria, um, <laughs> uh, it's basically my identifier, um, and it's part of my question actually, which is for Yanis. I was I was across the water from you when the refugee crisis was happening. I was in Turkey reporting on Syria, and I know what it's like to have all of these journalists come in where there's reporting on on your country and the problems that are happening in, in, in where you grew up, and and I was wondering what it was like for you to as a as a Greek photojournalist to see the effect of a war that's far away trickle through your country that was going through a really tough time as it was and and how that affected your reporting because you were like you said a war reporter for a long time but I don't know if you've ever done anything that hit as close to home as the Syrian refugee crisis um, when it hit your country so I was wondering how that affected you and how it affected your reporting if if you think you brought something to the table that you know, foreign journalists who are not from Greece, um, that if you were able to bring anything that they wouldn't have been able to. Yeah, well, it, you know, it was um, usually I, I, I live in Greece or I lived abroad for a few years, but I lived in Greece and then I travel outside Greece covering you know war stories and conflicts and natural catastrophes, and then I go back to Greece and it feels like I'm uh, back in paradise. And then the last uh, several years, since uh, you, you know, 2011, we had this terrible financial, political, and I call it also cultural crisis. And 2015, we had two elections, we had referendum, we had uh, 
uh, capital controls and we had 850,000 refugees coming. So, uh, you know, uh, I, didn't, I, di I didn't travel for several years because, you know, I use this expression, I used to go to uh, find the war out there and then the war came to find me. And uh, it, it wasn't easy because it's, it's terrible and it's, it's very difficult as I, uh, you know, I've discovered to cover the catastrophe of your own country. And uh, how can you be impartial when you see your, you know, members of your family or colleagues, uh, you know, suffering, a lot of people with a lot of uh, psychological, you know, problems and uh, uh, they lose their jobs and all this, especially in the media business. But anyway, I, I was also, you know, in 2015 with, uh, with the refugee crisis, which apparently is one of the most photographed and re reported stories of the 21st century, um, I, I was in, uh, in a state of uh, shock, um, but also I was in a state of Ooh, let's see how the Greeks are going to, uh, you know, uh, respond to this crisis. Because after all, you know, I'm Greek, right? Nobody's perfect, but <laughs> uh, so, I, you know, for me, is are they going to show that uh, you know they're they're good people? Is humanity going to prevail? Is uh, or we are going to be like, uh, uh, you know, in the in the in, in history? Uh, the bad guys in Europe and so you know this was uh, put a lot of pressure on me of course I was there and I did um, you know I sought uh, pictures of people helping I saw uh, pictures of people not helping I saw pictures of the police pushing uh, I, you know I, I couldn't take part otherwise you know what kind of journalist I am um, so but it was difficult in, in the sense that I had to to do the job I usually do in other countries away, and I'm totally impartial um, I, in my country. Um, now, I, I don't know, I, I hope I did it right, and um, yeah, I hope I did it right. So, I don't know, did I answer your question? <laughs> yes, you did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Next, please. By the way, we can now ask questions of any member of the panel. <laughs> Uh, thank ahead. you for all the panelists and for the photographer. Uh, so uh, my name is EE. E. I'm a master's student in philosophy at Columbia. So my question might be a, a bit philosophical because of my background. Um, and so uh, as journalists and photographers, uh, who can decide which story to tell to the public and how to reconstruct them? Have you ever questioned or thought about whether you should cover a story, or if so, how do you reconstruct them? Um, I hear some of you saying the feeling of ang angry, sad, um, upset, and sometimes even when you don't have a personal anger towards something that you believe it is right for the public to feel the anger. So I just wonder in this process if you have questioned what justice is actually is and the difference between what is injustice for you and for the public. So I'm not looking for like a theory to justify it, but I just really am curious about like your personal reflection on this. So thank you. Elisa, do you want to take that question? Uh, this is the Rubin uh, philosophy of yeah. journalism. Um, I, I, I would say I, I certainly think about that I, I, all the time, and I imagine that other people do, other journalists do too, because if you're working in a, in a foreign culture, you're very aware that what you might think of as right or a priority might not be to someone else. So one of the things that at least I do a lot is trying to, I, I ask people what, you know, what did you think about this or that event? I mean, did, you, did, did this seem wrong, right, warranted? You know, you, you try to understand how it's seen in the culture. And then, and usually what turns out is that it's seen in a variety of different ways because there are many, you know, cultures aren't uniform by any means, and and so you you think about that, and then you can really figure out where your biases are. But that was one of the things that 
was always in my mind in Afghanistan because clearly the whole way that Afghan society is organized and it's not just Islam, it's also about a, you know, a fairly isolated um, until recently very rural world and I don't know how that works so I have to be told how, how it works, but also hear what, how they want it to work, how different people want it to work, and then, and then you tell your story cognizant of those things. Thank you. Next, please. Hi, my name's Nafisa, um, and this question's for all the panelists. Uh, when it comes to this type of journalism, um, obviously you encounter an enormous amount of inju injustice. So um, whether it be, you know, men unfairly uh, jailed in cages, or a man with his children falling off a boat into the water, um, and without any judgment. Um, where do you draw the line between standing back and documenting um, as a means to an end, and stepping in and doing what little you can to help? It's a tough one. Who wants to take that question? Robin? Margie? <laughs> Where do you draw the line between documenting and then trying to help? Where is... Can I? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I, I had this dilemma many times. But, you know, I feel that by working I help. Because, you know, I tell the story a lot of times, not only in, the, you know, in this story, in every story. I had people coming to me and, you know, like, Man, please tell our story. This is, you know, the, the, a lot of people see you as a life jacket, as uh, somebody who can help. And by telling the story, you help. I, I said before, you know, uh, uh, I will tell you the story and then you decide what to do. But also, a lot of times we've seen, you know, that governments and organizations are under, under pressure because of our stories. Imagine if if uh, nobody was on the Greek islands, no journalists, no, no nobody, and these people would come, then, you know, the police, the army, the locals who didn't like them, they would do whatever they want. Maybe they would shoot them, on, you know, before they even land. So we were there, and I, I feel strongly that we protected them. And then they would come out and they would tell us the story, please do something. So I, I do help uh, when I feel that I have to do physically something. So, for example, you know, there is a situation when somebody has a, an issue, you know, is wounded or uh, whatever, and I, am, I feel that I have to help. If, if I am surrounded by 20 doctors, I won't do it. I will take pictures of the doctors and use these pictures as an example. You know, tell the story of the doctors or, or, or the volunteers or whoever. But if I feel that I am the person who has to actually do something, I will, I will leave the camera and I will help without telling, you know, uh, people. Because, you know, when you do this, you don't want to tell people that, you know, I'm the guy, I help. We see this sometimes, you know. <laughs> so anyway, you know, it's part of the, my values. So do, do any of you want to take that question, how do you negotiate this? Is when is, you know, just being there and telling the story, when is that enough and when it ever isn't? I think it really depends in each particular case. Um, I think in the fishing story, it was a really, that was a really unique um, story. Nobody else knew these men were there. If we published the story and allowed their names to be used, um, they would have, could have been beaten, they could have been killed. If we blurred their faces, um, the power of the, the, the men who were brave enough to speak and risk our lives, um, we take away the power of their story which was also what, what would free them. So, I mean, in that, that, that Well, let me just re remind them that the AP did something extraordinary in this case because it reported the slaves to um, the International Organization for Migration, which then arranged a rescue. Right, yeah. so the men who, who were actually um, quoted in the story or whose faces we used in the photographs or in the video 
we, um, through Marjorie's source at the IOM, made sure that the Marine police could get them off the island before we published the story. So, so you felt responsible for the safety of, of the people you were Not just about. the safety, but also that the story that they told and the power of the story came out. You know, it's, it wasn't really up to us to decide, should we blur their faces? Should we, should we take out their names? That changes the story. That takes away their voice. Alisa, do you want to oh. weigh in on this? No, I, 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 I know. I just thought what Rob, Robin said was right also about it being a really case by case. And I, I think the hardest thing in these stories in foreign, in foreign places is that by publishing them, you can really harm people. Mm. And, and leave them very, very vulnerable to, to, uh, to being killed or imprisoned or beaten. You, you, you don't even know what it will be. So you have to be, you sometimes have to not tell a story you want to tell until you're really 100% sure you're not going to just make someone's life worse. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Next question. Hello again. I wrote my question down. It's for Yanis, because it's more coherent if I write it down. So in taking photos, photos capture a moving moment in time. How do you manage to capture these moments and then go forth and learn of the people you're capturing without interrupting what they're going through? Because you describe each of these photos that we're watching, but these are moments that are actually happening. How are you able to then go back and get you know, insight into the people that are experiencing these things? I, 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 I couldn't hear you. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. I mean, you know, it's the, the impact of my work. Uh, <laughs> can, you, can you speak louder and I more will. slowly? Please? Can sorry. you hear yeah. me now? Yeah, OK. So I said, in taking photos, photos capture a moving moment in time. How do you manage to capture these moments and then go forth and learn of the people you're capturing without interrupting what they're going through? Because you do describe um, the photos that you're taking, but they're moving moments in time. How are you able to then, you know, stop and ask these people, you know, what is it? Who are you? You know, tell me about your life, and then report on that when you can see that they're going through such a turbulent time. Well, you know, every time is a different uh, situation, and you know, the experience experience helps a lot to judge. Uh, you know, a lot of times you take pictures, and then you feel that these people they don't want to be photographed or they tell you stop and you have to respect this. And uh, you know, we, we said before that sometimes you actually harm people uh, instead of helping. So I always, I'm always aware of this and sometimes they will tell me, please don't take pictures because my family is in Syria and if they see and so it, it can be very complicated. So you need to respect the people you're taking photographs or you interview or you're doing a story and make sure that you're not going to harm them instead of, uh, you know, help, help them. And it's, it, well, you know, you learn with uh, experience and you read the messages and you, you the, the body language and, and everything. And also, you know, usually people have their problems and they're doing their own thing. And if you're not dressed in uh, like a clown or you don't jump up and down or you make a lot of noise, people, they don't really care much about you. So you can be a little bit like a, um, a invisible, which is, it's good. I more so meant like, how are you able to stop them as they're like, for instance, the picture of. Well, I follow them. I walk with them. Oh, okay. <laughs> of course, yeah. You know, I, I want. Sometimes I offer them to to you know, if it's like a situation when an old lady and no, I don't want to play the good guy, but you know, obviously I'm a human and I you know I have family and everything. So sometimes, as I said, I would stop and you know pack the car with people. Um, and uh, apparently in, in Greece there was a law that, you know, if you pick up uh, refugees and migrants, uh, the police can, uh, can uh, you know, persecute you, uh, you know, uh, for uh, human trafficking. And, uh, and so you have to be very careful. So I took some uh, chances a few times thinking, okay, if they stop me, I'm going to say, look, I'm just trying to help these people. And, and uh, actually somebody was... Um, 
you are arrested for doing this. And uh, anyway, um, so yeah, you know, every time is different. You walk with them or you, the, the body language and the way, uh, you know, if you are honest, I'll tell you, they, f they feel honesty. So you go there and you say, hi, my name is Yanis and I work for Reuters and you know, I, I'm taking your pictures and let me know what is your name, what is your story, and usually they say yes. If they say no, okay, you respect, but you have to be very honest. You know, usually I tell them, look, I, I, you know, I don't believe in miracles, but I, I hope that I make some people feel guilty or make some people feel ashamed for this situation and help you, but I can't promise. So, you, I, I, you know, I'm always very straight and honest and, um, you know, people open up. They, you know, they talk to me. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we're welcome. Next, please. Hi, my name's Elise. Thank you for coming. Uh, I have a question about your editorial process. All of your stories sort of document extremes of human suffering, and there's sort of varying degrees of, like, graphic detail. How do you choose where to draw the line uh, with the details that maybe are, are very extreme and sensitive? How do you choose which ones to include for the story and, and what should be left out? I think that, you know, we talk a lot about our stories and um, I mean, you know, we, we try to, I think, make our stories as realistic as possible. I think that's the goal for all of us. Um, we don't want to whitewash anything that we see. Obviously, there are times when you can't put everything in that you want to put in for various reasons, but, you know, I think that uh, you have long talks with your editor, and we, you know, as a team, um, we have long talks often, too, about, you know, what we want to say and what we don't want to say, and it's not just about, um, you know, what to put in and what to leave out, or it's, it's also about how to construct it and the most powerful way t to construct the stories. And I think that, you know, y you look at the stories presented here tonight, I mean, I, I don't know how much time went into the reporting versus the writing, but I can tell you from, from our experience that, um, you know, it's something that, that we think about so much because, again, it's like a photograph, you know, it, it, anybody can, take a picture and anybody can write a story but you know if you if you find that story and you find those details and I think that a good journalist will um, will just dig I mean for me when I'm interviewing somebody I drive everyone around me crazy so if the photographer is with me and the videographer is with me they just get so annoyed and they usually just leave me because I will just sit with the person and talk to them or sometimes hours at a time. And I get a sense of, you know, during the interview, okay, I know this person is gonna be somebody that I'm gonna to wanna to spend a lot of time with. And in one case, you know, we followed the man home who had been in Indonesia for 22 years, and we spent a lot of time with him in Indonesia and also um, in, in Myanmar as well, getting a sense of his story and, and himself as well. And, and so I think that, you know, it's something to be very mindful of when you are working on a story. Um, you know, how can you make it as powerful as possible? And, and again, there's never enough reporting. You can never ever, I don't think, report enough on a story. There's always more to get. Hi, uh, my name is Lulu. I'm from J School. Um, uh, I I originally from China, so I first read the fish slavery story in Chinese. Uh, I'm very <laughs> happy to see the people behind the story. So my question is, after so much efforts, do you think you have the result uh, after the story published? Do you have the expected result? If you don't have the expected result, do you feel disappointed? Well, we didn't expect 2,000 men would be freed, I think, when we went into this. Um, I think we are happy that there is attention on this issue a little more than when we went and started reporting on it. 
Um, but Thailand was only one example, and there are thousands of men still out there. Um, so I think we could report this story for the rest of our careers if we wanted to. <laughs> I think it's going to take a long time to fix that, to fix this problem. Thank you. Hi again. Um, I have a couple of questions, if I may. One is uh, about metho methodology. Uh, that one is for Ms. Rubin. Uh, the other one is a rather emotional one. Um, when, when, for somebody who's just starting in, in the profession, right, could, could you explain what, what, how do you do it? In other words, I imagine Somebody tells me, Manuel, you're going to go to Kabul and uh, re re investigate the murder of this woman. I land in Kabul. I figure first thing I do is I probably look, at, look, look for their family. But then, then what? Uh, who, who is with you? Did you plan anything before you went? Uh, did you contact people in um, Afghanistan? Did you? Just a brief summary of how you started the whole thing. Well, I had, I had been working in Afghanistan um, for about four years um, before I decided to do this particular story. I had left Afghanistan but went back to do it. Um, so I think a lot like um, the uh, AP team, you know, they, they had years and years in the region. And so they had a lot of depth of knowledge about how, how it works. And, you know, you, you just sit down when you're going to do a story. It, as you, you know, for any, any story that's going to be complicated, and you make a list of what are the kinds of people I would need to talk to. Well, let's see, I'd need to talk to policemen and lawyers and people who were there and family members. And, you know, you just break it down. And then you start to work with a local reporter or translator to see how, whether you can find those people. And then, you know, you. Some of them you'll be able to find easily. Some of them are officials. Some of them are going to be people where you don't know how to reach them. But you try to get some other people who might know how to reach them. And you just keep going until, until you've got all the pieces. I mean, at one point, we went to her house, Farkunda's house. No one lived there, we thought. But it turned out, actually, that some people did live there. And it was her uncle and, and, uh, and his children. Um, but but her her family had had fled, and you know for whatever reason they let us come in and showed us her her bedroom and the house and you know that was just doing it on a on a on a whim or on a chance to see if we could even get it you know we didn't know if we'd even find the house but it turned out everyone knew where the house was so you just you just keep going with down sort of you make a list of all your potential. Um, sources, and then you follow each one till you till you get as close as you possibly can. Thank you. Um, if I may, the, the next question is for uh, Ms. Marson and Ms. McDowell. Did you meet with any of the freed slaves after they had been freed? Uh, did they know uh, they were pretty much freed because of you? And if you did meet them, do please tell us the details. Yes. So. Um, you know, we're in regular contact with a lot of them, and, and yes, I mean, I think um, for us, we, we did this, uh, after the slaves were, were freed and taken to this island, um, kind of, uh, what, 12 or 18 hours from Benjina, they were held in this makeshift area. And um, we went there and we took uh, these surveys that we had written up in three different languages, and we distributed them to I think 300 guys, and um, we we built a database, and, and Martha and I, um, we we um, well Esther translated a lot of the Burmese ones, and Martha and I and, and Robin too. We we added them to the to the database, and um, you know one of the things that we saw that was was just so amazing was that every now and then you'd, you'd get something from someone, and they would say, you know, my life was really awful. Um, but I just want to thank the people who helped to free us. You know, now we have our lives back. And, you know, we've been thanked by these guys, and, and they, you know, they, they know, I mean, especially Esther. Um, everybody, I think, 
everybody knows Esther. <laughs> um, she's their hero. So, so yeah, I mean, um, unfortunately, you know, as Robin said, for our story, um, you know, we would like to say that we, we helped to free these men and they went home and, and their lives are now great and every, it's a happy ending, but it's unfortunately in a lot of cases not. Um, a lot of these men went home with nothing. They have um, a lot of psychological problems now that they're dealing with. Um, their families are very poor. Um, they are an, a financial burden on their families and they feel very ashamed. And um, you know, in a couple of cases we know guys who have said, look, we, we can't find work in Burma and so you know, the only thing we know how to do is fish and so they've ended up um, you know, thinking that they're vetting um, you know, through friends or friends of friends and getting on to uh, you know, good boats and they've, they've wound up back at sea in a couple of cases you know, they were at sea for six months without touching land and then just dumped, you know, in Thailand with no money. Um, we've, we've heard numerous stories of these types of things. So, um, you know, a lot of these men were never compensated for the work that they did as well. So it's been a real, a real struggle. Thank you. Ida. Yes. Hi. Congratulations for amazing stories. Um, I just wanted to ask you how crucial it was to pick a fixer to work on these stories. How did you go about picking someone? And also, I'm not sure about the language, but I always find it fascinating to report in a country where you don't necessarily speak the language. So I, I would love to hear your thoughts about can, can, this. Can I ask the others to ask the questions and then we'll just have one round where okay. the, our panelists answer that. So fixer question and then, yes. Hi, my name is Shana. I'm from the J School. Thank you all for being here. Um, my question is, uh, a few of you have mentioned that you, know, you never feel like you've reported enough. So how do you decide when to stop and to start writing? Okay. Um, hi, my name is uh, Nadim. I have a question for Lisa. Um, I spoke to a friend of mine, a war correspondent, and they said to me that when they were uh, reporting in Iraq that there comes a point when they were no longer felt that they were able to uh -huh relate to their life back home uh, if they continued working in that environment. So I wanted to know when do you know when is the time to call it a day? Okay, all good questions. Who wants to take the fixer store, um, question? How do you choose a fixer? How do you navigate working in a foreign language? Being reliant on a fixer's translation? How do you find a fixer? How do you find and choose a fixer? Yeah. Can I? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Well, you know, fixers and drivers are very important for our job and especially, you know, if you find a, a good fixer that can drive and can speak good English, <laughs> why not? Okay. Yeah. So, so, yeah, because, you know, you have, to, you have to think about the financial situation of the media. It was, I remember in the 90s, for example, in Yugoslavia. You like that? Huh? Yeah, so true. <laughs> It's true, it's true. I remember in the 90s in, uh, in Yugoslavia, for example, a, you know, we had a lot of money, so you can pay, or in Chechnya, I remember Chechnya was one of the, you know, very extreme places, so I remember 94, 95, I used to pay $300 the driver and another $300 the translator. Wow. You cannot do this today. So anyway, so that's why, you, uh, but it, they're very important. The way I find, I think, you know, more or less, uh, everybody has the same answer. Um, you know, you, you find your local uh, contact somehow. I mean, you're a journalist, you have to find it. Sometimes there is a hotel or an area where people hang out, and you, you look for, you ask your colleagues, or you, you know, you, you use your knowledge or your instinct to find a, uh, and, and usually uh, with, with the fixers is you, uh, what, what I do is I ask them a kind of semi-complicated question to see if they really understand English or not, <laughs> right? And then, uh, you know, usually, and if they say, so I say, you know, you, you, are you a really, really bad person, right? And he says, yes, then he's not the right person. 
uh, it's like, you know, children. Um, uh, yeah. How? Yes, okay. So, yes. So then when you find the, the right people, uh, it's, it's very important because, you know, this person is your, your ears, basically, and, and, and your eyes. And if you can, uh, they're not, uh, you know, ready-made. There is no place where you find fixers. So you have to educate your fixer. And a lot of times I'm trying to, um, you know, I tell them what I want, you know, like, uh, have your ears open, listen to the radio, uh, you know, talk with your friends, find out what's going on, um, you know, if they have some uh, inside information, if they know, the, you know, somebody in the police or in the army. But also I try to inspire them. So, for example, in Afghanistan I had this young um, a student of uh, medicine, and I found the, I found him in up in north Afghanistan, and I I kind of educate him, and I I you know I said, look, you see all these people, they're they're trying to stop us from telling the truth, and our job is even by taking risks uh, to tell the truth around the world. This is how we're gonna help your country. And he was like, wow, yeah, I like that, and this and that. This guy is our chief photographer in Asia now. He's our chief photographer in Asia because he loved the whole thing and he believed in the idea and he, you know. So it's, it's, it's super crucial, it's super important. And also, to, you know, to have somebody who tells you the truth and he's not hiding things and he's not, he doesn't have an agenda, which is very dangerous. All right, so I'd, I'd like to ask the rest of our panel to take all those three questions in like one big summation. Um, how important is a fixer? When do you stop reporting? And how do you relate to life back home if you've been elsewhere for so long? Um, well, yeah, I mean, fixer is, is vital. You, you, can't, you can't operate. If you don't speak the language, I mean, you must have, and oftentimes the fixer and the translator is the same person. And it's just, you can't, they are your eyes and your ears in the country. Um, they know all of the cultural sensitivities that you may or may not know. Um, they're also, you know, the person who has your back. The fixer is the person who says, okay, we need to leave, things are getting dangerous, or we shouldn't be here, or hey, you know, <laughs> hey, I know a secret way we can do this, and we can work this, and hey, I know this, and we can go this way, and I know this person, and that, that person can lead us to this person, and so, you know, it, it, it is, it's absolutely crucial. Um, when do you stop reporting? When your editor makes you stop reporting, that's when you stop. I think, I, I don't know, we, we, we never stop. We never stop reporting. Even I think when we're in final draft mode, we're still questioning things and asking, oh, maybe we should call this person. Oh, maybe we should look at this. Oh, maybe there's some documents we can get here. I mean, right up until publishing. And I think that's really important, you know, to, to always be, even when you think you've got it and you think you've nailed it, you know, I mean, there were a couple of times when we said, wait a minute, what about this? Did we, should we look at this? Maybe we should dig a little bit, you know, and, and you find something, something else. Um, what was the third question? How do you relate to life back home? Oh, well, I've been overseas now for 13 years, and so it's, um, coming back home is foreign to me. Um, Southeast Asia is home at this point. Um, you know, it's, I absolutely love it. It's, it was my dream to go there, and um, you know, I coming back is um, it's always kind of a reverse kind of this weird going down the ice cream aisle in the grocery store is very um, strange to me because there's just so many choices, and and I think that when you spend um, so many years kind of living among um, all these different people from different countries and seeing oftentimes people um, in incredible poverty, but, you know, having this joy for life, you know, and, and then you come back here and you see everybody having, um, you know, so, so much, and you think, 
do you really need to have everything that we have here to have you know joy in your life and I think um, you know it's something that I think about sometimes when I come back Robin um, I'll keep it short I think <laughs> Margie said a lot of the things that I feel as well um, I will say having a good fixer is like heaven. I mean, the people who will point out things that you don't even, you know, what this graffiti said, oh, look at this, you know, point out things that you just will become the story often. They find the story. Um, and having a bad fixer, it's you just wasted your, you wasted your time, you wasted your day, you wasted money, you wasted everything. So, um, the second question when was, you stop reporting. when you stop I don't yeah you never stop um, because the story never really stops if you keep reporting you're gonna find something that will probably be the next story that you're working on or might come back to you you know five years later and and f turn into something um, and going home. going home well I lived in Southeast Asia as well for most of the last 20 years so that kind of was home um, so it wasn't really like going home. I already was home at that time. <laughs> Elisa, you have the final word. Um, yeah. Well, I, I think everyone has said everything on fixers. You know, fi fixers are the the most important part of the of the picture, and if you you just have you have to have someone you trust, and um, you also need someone who really is basically smarter than you about the place and, and willing to tell you when you're wrong. And that's, that's really important. Um, on reporting, everything's also been said. You never, you, never, you never stop. You have to write at some point, and then while your editor is editing it, you keep on reporting and then furtively change things. <laughs> Um, say, you know, we can't really say that because I just got one more piece of information that I just, that we, we just would be dishonest if we left it out. <laughs> um, and, um, and on when do you go home, I guess um, I haven't lived in one place and I've, I've worked a lot in war zones and I think when you stop thinking that something is a story, when you begin to say, oh, it was another bomb today, then then you know it's it's probably time to at the very least take a break if not leave because if you can't see the story anymore there's something amiss thank you so much to our panel we learned a lot tonight thank you Yanis, Elisa, Robin, Margie and thank you to all of you for being here with us and happy 100th birthday to the Pulitzer Prizes <laughs>